Thank you for inviting me to talk. I've been asked to provide a brief historical background to today's theme. I'm happy to do so. I would like to begin by discussing an immigrant group in Burma. And please bear with me for a few moments before forming any judgments. Before the 14th century, there is no evidence that they even existed, or for the language that they used, or for the particular religion that they hold today, or for their particular ethnic culture as we, we would know it. They appear in Arakan in close association with the foreign court. They are both immigrants and foreigners to the region we know as Arakan. I'm not referring to the Rohingya, the theme of today's talks, but to the Yakin Burmese speakers, the Theravada Buddhists, whose culture, religion, ethnicity is foreign to the Arakan region and is predated by the Muslim presence there. Now, having said this, can I step back and argue that I'm not seeking to switch the positions of the Rohingya and the Yakin? I'm suggesting that if we apply the same historical method to the Akhine that I have seen applied to the historicity of the Rohingya by so much of the scholarship on the country in the years since my dissertation, no group in Arakan would pass the test as indigenous. The problem is that the history of Arakan before the 14th century and arguably to a certain extent before the 15th century is far murkier than a lot of the scholarship would have you believe. What we know is that there was an Indo-Aryan population speaking a non-Tibeto-Burman language, writing in an Indic script, building temples and practicing religion that was Hindu-Buddhist along North Indian lines, that was part of the larger Bay of Bengal world, which was outside of the Irrawaddy zone of interaction. Then suddenly in the late 14th and early 15th centuries, we have invasions from the Irrawaddy Valley, from the Kingdom of Ava and the Kingdom of Bagal, which at the time were engaged in a massive war with each other. And they enter Arakan and place their own kings and queens on the throne and bring in administrators, soldiers, and settlers from the Irrawaddy Valley. And what was there in Arakan before gets transformed by integration with the Irrawaddy Valley. Burmese language appears, Burmese script predominates, Theravada Buddhism appears as a royal cult at first and then disseminates to the general population. Theravada Buddhist monks arrive, and Irrawaddy Valley material culture probably also had its own impact from this time. But even afterward, this remained one of many influences in Arakan. And in another murky episode, a new line of indigenous kings, the Mrao'u dynasty, was established in the early 15th century, one that saw itself rooted in the Muslim world, one that adopted the Muslim confession of faith, that used Persian and Muslim titles, that built mosques as well as pagodas. And this court and culture had space for all. It was not so much syncretic, but heterodox. Its population not so much homogeneous and exclusivist, but inclusive and heterogeneous. One that was not bigoted, bigoted but tolerant. We are blinded to the possibilities of such a place because of the impact of the modern nation state. First, it requires conformity to the contemporary national imaginary, not a partial subscription. For example, although Burma is admitted today as having many ethnic groups, these ethnic groups are essentialized. So that the majority is Theravada Buddhist, Burmese speaking, and Burman, but only in one way. So you can't have different kinds of Theravada Buddhists, Burmese speaking, Burmans. They all have to be of a singular type. So whatever is truly Rakhine is being viewed, understood, and turned into Yakhine, losing its regional essence, its independent take on things, and being reworked on an Irrawaddy Valley template, what I have called in the past Irrawaddyization. Now this is one problem of the modern nation state for Rakhine, making things look like, like the Irrawaddy Burmans. This is not an uncommon problem because it replicates similar developments in other countries around the globe as part of the development of the nation state. Second, the nation state and the expansion of what some have called state space was also accompanied by the eradication of pre-existing governmentalities and what I would like to call, if you would allow, social mentalities or cultural mentalities. These are approaches to socializing, building local societies and cultures that are in communication 
with environmental constraints and opportunities, cultural influences, the movements of people, and so on. If we look back into the early days of Rakhine, and I assert that Rakhine pre-existed the Theravada Buddhist, Burmese-speaking, Burmese culture that has appropriated the term today, we find, we again find a people whose culture was directed at inclusion and diversity, the kind necessary to keep a land in a challenging, unforgiving climate populated, and this was very challenging indeed. And a very small population, minute by Irrawaddy Valley standards, was built and maintained by attracting Muslims and Hindus, Buddhists of all varieties and Europeans, giving them space, the court patronizing all of their gods, and developing a court culture that reflected a wide political, cultural, and religious remit. And this entire region, not just the half lying south of the Naf, is Rakhine. This social mentality was eradicated sometime after the Burman conquest in the mid-1780s. What many of those writing about the history of the, of the region in recent years do not tell you is that most of the Burmese language historical sources in Rakhine were written after the Burman conquest. So when something is not found in European or Persian language sources, that is, when it comes from a Burmese language chronicle, it relates Rakhine's state of social mentality sometime after 1785. And we find that with each new chronicle that the coverage of pre-1785 Rakhine makes the latter look more and more like the Irrawaddy Valley Burma and British India. The Rakhine look increasingly like Theravada Buddhists, Burmese-speaking Burmans, are supposed to look what we might call, again, Yakhine rather than Rakhine. And those who look different are portrayed increasingly as troublesome outsiders. The Rohingya go from being fellow villagers to Mohammedans to Bengalis to Bengali marauders. And the presence of the Yakhine culture is wretched back into the immeasurable depths of the past as if it had always been that way as it stood in the 1780s. It had always been that way for 2,000 years. And it is this effort, the remaking of Rakhine into a nativist Yakhine imaginary, that is behind the recasting that continues today. Archaeological sites, texts, and other sources are being remade or expunged to develop a historical record that emphasizes an unchallenged cultural and religious homogeneity to the region. Arakan is part of a greater Myanmar. This is an imaginary that has erased Arakan's integration into the Myanmar nation state that has, I'm sorry, eased Arakan's integration into the Myanmar nation state, but has simultaneously undermined Arakanese society itself and miscast an area of movement, inclusion, and immigration into one of stasis, exclusion, and closure. This is imaginary that claims that the term Rohingya is a post-war invention by Muslim separatists, but in fact it is not. I should stress that when we look at the beginning of this process at some point, uh, at, at some of the only reliable documentation from the period, the late 18th century, such as Francis Buchanan's diary and other writings, we find that he says quite clearly, the Mohammedans who have long settled in Arakan call themselves Rohingya or natives of Arakan. There has been a lot of effort to cover this up or reject it, but there is no getting around this. You have a source from that time period whose account was published in a journal from that time which says that the Muslims of the Burman Empire call themselves Rohingya or natives of Arakan. This is as crystal clear as a historical source can get. 1799, Rohingya was a term used by the Muslims that meant for them the natives of Arakan. There is no genuine, there is no genuine controversy over what this term means, what it meant, what it, when it was said, it did not come from the 1940s or the 1950s. It was not an invention of political provocateurs. Any attempt to dismiss this kind of evidence has to be intended to obscure the truth, not reveal it. No good historian would suggest otherwise. By the way, this was something I, I had found and actually republished in the SOAS Bulletin of Burma Research back in 2003. It has been up online ever since and free to download PDF, and there is no excuse, no excuse for anyone anywhere legitimately disputing the historicity of Rohingya, depriving an ethnic minority of their own self-reference. 
The main point is that we've had Rohingya as long as we have had Rakhine, perhaps and certainly longer than we have had the Irrawaddy Valley replicants, the Yakine. This short presentation has tried to highlight some of the major elements of this change from a religious and cultural homoge culturally homo heterogeneous immigration society, immigrant society on the crossroads of Bengal and Burma to one that has been misimagined by some as a sort of Theravada Buddhist Burman nativist bastion on the frontiers of the Muslim world. I do stress my point is not to undermine Rakhine Buddhists, but to point to the shared immigrant nature of the entire population of the region. The shared and relative recentness to the, to the emergence of the Rakhine and Rohingya ethnic and religious communalism of today. I would sincerely like to remind them of the true Rakhine past and its inclusive and heterogeneous orientations and of the historical harmony that existed before the emergence of the modern nation state, a process begun, by the way, with British rule in 1824 and not from 1948. I also wish to highlight the historicity, of course, of the term Rohingya, as legitimate and older than the Ikhain identity proffered today, proffered today by those who would seek to undermine a region's unique culture and history. Thank you for letting me present my 